So today I will present uh, with uh, Katarina Gvozik, my colleague, um, our works on structural on the structural anchoring of uh, spontaneous analogies, as Matthew said. And just to give a brief overview of the presentation. So first I will start by highlighting the role of uh, familiar concepts uh, in encoding and how these concepts uh, can permit structural encoding of daily life situations. Then I will present uh, experimental studies showing that uh, this type of encoding is what allows people to retrieve experiences based on structural similarities in uh, daily life. And then Katarina will go on with the educational stakes of this uh, approach and more precisely on the consequence of encoding familiar structures uh, for arithmetic world problem solving. And she'll also uh, talk about how to overcome uh, these initial encodings uh, when necessary. And uh, at least we will conclude. So just a it's not really my screen and it's okay. So analogies are uh, generally described as a parallel drawn between the structure of two situations uh, independently from their surface features. So structure has been defined as a system of abstract relations, whereas the surface uh, qualifies objects and object attributes of the situations. Uh, so for instance, the comparison between the solar system and the atomic structure is an analogy because the situations uh, share a system of abstract relations, uh, despite the fact that they present different objects. Moreover, uh, studies have decomposed analogical reasoning into several sub-processes. First, a uh, source has to be retrieved from long-term memory, then uh, it is mapped to the targets in working memory. And then there is a transfer uh, process with the projection of inferences. And finally, a learning may take place through the extraction of a schema describing the common structure of the two analogs. So the, the implementation of these sub-processes has been extensively studied uh, with an experimental paradigm uh, where participants first receive a source problem with its solution. For example, the general army problem uh, and then they have to resolve a target analog problem, for instance, the famous radiation problem, which can be resolved in an, an analogous way. So when participants are uh, invited to use the general army problem, they uh, generally perform well at transferring the convergence uh, solution. This has led to the consensual view that the mapping process is oriented toward uh, structural similarity. However, uh, without an invitation to use the source problem, participants often fail to retrieve it from long-term memory to spontaneously produce the solution. And these results have led to the view that analogies uh, based on structural similarity would uh, depend on an explicit mechanism and that they would rarely uh, be implemented uh, spontaneously. <clears throat> Uh, it has even been proposed that the retrieval process would be mainly guided by surface rather than uh, structural similarities. In a study by Genner and collaborators, uh, one of the source stories presented to the participants was about a hawk making a deal with the hunter so as not to uh, get attacked, but finally the uh, hunter um, uh, shot her anyways. The corresponding target queue uh, for some participant could be a superficially different analog uh, about a small country making a deal with a bigger country so as not to get attacked, but the big country finally attacked uh, anyways. Um, so this is the, the superficially different analog. Uh, and uh, for other participants, uh, the target story uh, was superficially similar and structurally dissimilar called the mere appearance match in the study. And it was about an eagle making a deal uh, with a hunter so as not to be attacked, but this time the hunter respected the, uh, his promise. So the results showed that uh, retrieval was more frequent in the absence of surface, um, in the presence sorry, of surface rather than uh, structural uh, similarities between the stories, suggesting that surface would overcome structural similarities in retrieval. And this uh, has been attributed to a surface as superficial encoding process in the absence of a specific expertise um, of the participant. 
However, uh, studies have shown that if formal structures uh, such as the one which is common to the radiation problem and its uh, analogs may not be encoded by lay adults, uh, familiar structures are encoded and influence analogical transfer. For instance, in a study by uh, Basak and collaborators, participants were faced with a source problem where prices were uh, randomly assigned to students and uh, the participants were trained to use a formula to determine the probability that a subset of prices would be randomly assigned to a subset of students. So the prediction was that participants uh, would not encode the formal uh, distributive structure of the problem, uh, which is elements distributed to other elements, but that they would encode a familiar get structure where objects are distributed uh, to people. Uh, in this way, it was predicted that participants would perform well on instantiating uh, this formula to a new problem where objects were distributed to, uh, to people, where computers were distributed uh, to secretaries, but not on an analog target problem where secretaries are assigned to computers, which does not uh, preserve the familiar structure objects obtained by people. So the, the results confirmed these uh, predictions uh, concerning the problem's difficulty. And they also uh, showed that participants uh, in the diff face with the difficult problem um, tended to uh, compute the probability that the computers would be distributed to secretaries uh, congruent with the get schema, although they actually had to do the inverse uh, in this problem. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, so, so, sorry. So it appears that people encode uh, concepts they are uh, familiar with. In fact, myriads of schemas uh, are learned uh, through uh, repeated day life analog uh, experiences, such as the schema of procrastination, of robbery, of counting one's chicken before they are hatched, et cetera, et cetera. So for instance, one may have procrastinated to do his or her homework, uh, procrastinate to send an email, procrastinate to clean uh, his or her oven uh, in a way that uh, uh, he or her, she, uh, he or she, sorry, uh, progressively gets uh, familiarized with the procrastination schema. And so when uh, he or she encounters a new instantiation of this schema, for instance, procrastinating um, medical appointment, this experience uh, should lead to the retrieval of uh, uh, structurally similar experiences. So this leads us to purpose the structural superiority hypothesis, which is that the use of abstract schemas in uh, daily life permits to encode the structure of our uh, experiences and to retrieve based on structural similarity. So in a recent study that I uh, led with Evelyn Clement and Emmanuel Sander, uh, we pointed out that in the story recall um, from Gendar and collaborators, uh, superficially similar stories systematically also shared a residual uh, structural similarity. So in the previous uh, example that I showed you, the mirror appearance uh, matches are structurally similar since in both cases, a bird makes a deal with a hunter to ensure his safety. And the two stories only differ at the end um, of this. Uh, at the end, uh, where uh, in one study, in one story, the hunter breaks the deal, whereas in the other, it does not uh, break this deal. So in our study, we provide a measure uh, showing that participants uh, perceive a substantial part of the superficially similar stories as uh, structurally similar. Uh, I will not present it here, but you can uh, look at our uh, paper if you're interested. And so most importantly, we created uh, uh, for the study new pairs of uh, stories uh, for which we made sure that they shared only uh, uh, surface or only structural uh, similarities. So we uh, compared the retrieval of superficially similar analogs versus superficially similar, uh, superficially dissimilar analogs, sorry, there's a, a little mistake versus superficially similar disanalogs. And so this allowed us to uh, assess the structural superiority hypothesis in which we will. So in this uh, experiment, participants read eight uh, source stories. They then fulfilled the five minute distracted task and then they read the target story. Uh, and they had to indicate whether the last story reminded them of one of the previous ones. 
Among the source uh, stories, one shared only the structure of the, of the target queue. Uh, so for instance, two stories shared the structure of competition ends when a rival helps the other in improving his or her signature ability. And another source shared only the surface uh, with the target queue, uh, since it's also involved the uh, pizza yoli and the semantic domain of food services. So importantly, these uh, superficially similar situations were disanalogs. They didn't share uh, any substantial part of their structure. Uh, so we were interested in the proportion of retrievals for uh, each type of source, and uh, the results showed that sources with structural similarity were more frequently retrieved than uh, sources with uh, surface similarity. And these results were replicated uh, when several superficially similar sources were presented to the participants, so several sources implying pizza yoli's story. Uh, they were also replicated when we interposed the longer delay between the presentation of the sources and the uh, target stories. So these results show that superficially dissimilar analogs are better retrieved than superficially similar disanalogs. Um, so when surface and structural similarities are uh, pitted against each other, structural similarity dominates uh, retrieval. Uh, this suggests uh, uh, the idea of daily life expertise, which is that familiar concept or spontaneously used to encode uh, structures. However, uh, daily life situations are not mostly written stories. Um, so in daily life, uh, the situations that we encounter are often dynamic situations with many uh, concrete visual uh, details. And so we wondered how uh, could this influence uh, analogical uh, retrieval. And so we know from previous studies that, that, that uh, dynamic visual displays with uh, sparse surface details promote uh, transfer, but do abstraction processes permit to filter surface details and focus on uh, structures. So we used uh, basically the, a similar paradigm as the one that I have uh, already shown with the story you recall, but this time we used uh, videos instead of stories. So again, sources shared either the structure of the targets uh, or the, its surface, but never uh, both. Uh, participants watched nine videos, they fulfilled a five minute distracted task, and then they watched one video, uh, the, 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 the target queue, and they had to indicate again, if the last video reminded them of one of the previous uh, videos. So I will now show you uh, the video. I will start with the with the target queue. So uh, I will. It's in French. I will translate uh, to you if if necessary. So it's the surface context of celebrating a birthday, and a girl wants to get a piece of cake. This girl realizes that there's a hair uh, in her piece of cake. And then she asks uh, another girl, hey, do you want a piece of cake? Take this one. And then she gets the, the last piece of cake. So she's uh, shamelessly using politeness to, to get the more uh, desirable uh, piece of cake. And I will now show you the source analog. which involve a widely different context. So there's a student realizing that uh, the, chair, the chair is sitting in is, uh, is flowed. And then he said to the other student, hey, if you want to sit in the front of the classroom, you can go there. So again, using politeness to uh, get the best here, you hear the best here. So these were the, the analog, and now I will show you the source with uh, surface similarity that uh, also talks about celebrating a birthday. So here it will be a, a couple celebrating their two years of uh, relationship. 
You say, oh, it's been two years, we're together, we have to celebrate this. Okay, go and get the, get the cake. So there is this cell and surface uh, similarity of uh, the presence of the cake with candles. And then they blow the candles. Okay. Um, so we present these videos with the other with other source uh, distractors, um, and we were interested in the proportion of retrievals uh, of uh, each type of source again, uh, and uh, the results showed that superficially dissimilar analogs were uh, again more frequently retrieved than superficially uh, similar disanalogs. Um, we replicated these results uh, when, uh, with uh, the introduction of several superficially similar uh, sources, um, which competed with the with the analog. So the, we pre we presented not only the, the the birthday video that I showed you, but also other involving various birthday uh, contexts. So uh, these results show that superficially dissimilar analogs are still better retrieved than superficially similar disanalogs when uh, situations are rich in perceptual uh, details, um, which suggests that family or concept permit to filter out surface details to focus on structures. Um, and so it shows that structurally based retrievals may indeed frequently occur in daily life uh, situations. So several uh, studies have uh, questioned the validity of the reception paradigm where uh, sources and targets are uh, introduced by the experimenter, uh, suggesting that uh, out of the experimental uh, context, the encoding might be of a, of a different nature. And this has led others to adopt a production paradigm where participants are asked to generate their own analogies. Um, so the, the interest of these authors is to compare the retrieval of uh, superficially similar analogs uh, versus the retrieval of superficially dissimilar analogs. So analogs with or without uh, surface similarity. Our aim is a bit different because we want to assess whether surface or structural similarity predominates in analogical retrieval. And so in the last uh, study that I will present, uh, we were interested in whether um, su uh, superficially dissimilar analogs uh, experiences are better retrieved than superficially similar disanalog uh, experiences. Uh, as we didn't, we, we didn't want to bias participants to retrieve uh, analogs, so we simply asked them to report all memories that would come to mind when uh, faced with a, a given situation, so we didn't ask them to generate analogies. And the targets were a short text describing daily life situations uh, that embodies familiar concepts, which uh, are even uh, lexicalized, such that there was a situation where someone procrastinated to uh, buy a light bulb and another target where someone gives an excuse not to go to uh, an exhibition. And so 97 uh, participants took part in this uh, experiment. And we coded the memories uh, reported by the participant as uh, sharing with the target either uh, only the structure, the structure and the surface, uh, only the surface or uh, neither the structure nor the, the surface. And so the, uh, the most important results is about the, the proportion of participants retrieving more superficially dissimilar analogs than superficially similar disanalogs are doing the inverse. And the, the analysis showed that participants retrieving more superficially dissimilar analogs than superficially similar disanalogs outnumbered uh, participants retrieving more superficially similar disanalogs than superficially uh, dissimilar uh, analogs. Uh, we also got interested uh, in the proportion of sources uh, of each type for the first uh, retrieval reported by uh, the participants. And this analysis showed that the first retrieval was uh, also more frequently a superficially dissimilar analog than a superficially similar disanalog. So this suggests that familiar concepts from daily life are uh, spontaneously used in the first uh, encoding uh, of a situation. 
So to sum up, the studies uh, presented uh, until now suggest that analogical retrieval in daily life is mainly guided by uh, structural uh, similarity. This suggests uh, that daily life are spontaneously used to understand family or structures. So these results uh, raise important questions concerning uh, education that Katarina has addressed in her uh, studies. And namely, a question is how students use daily life concepts to constrain their uh, understanding of arithmetic world problems. So again, the, the, the perspective will be that familiar structures rather than formal ones tend to be preferentially uh, encoded. Okay. Uh, so, as you have seen, people encode situations with concepts that are familiar to them. And this is also what we observe in children's mathematics learning and problem solving. Uh, for example, when students are presented with a problem such as Luke has 42 marbles during recess, he lose three, uh, loses three marbles. How many marbles does Luke have now? Well, they encode the situation by relying on the conceptual structure of subtraction as taking away. And this is observed through the strategies that they report, which reflect these underlying conceptual structures. Yet, uh, if we look at a, uh, another problem, such as Maria has 39 marbles, during recess she gained some, now she has 42 marbles, how many did she gain? Well, even though this is also a subtraction problem, the semantic structure leads to a different structural encoding. Uh, children encode it by relying on the concept of determining the difference. And both of these uh, conceptual structures from, come from their daily life experience. It's just that the semantics of the problem activates one rather than the other. And uh, this different structural encoding also leads to a different solving strategy. If we now look at the processes of how students solve these problems, we see that the, well, we have shown that uh, the text of the problem uh, is encoded by activating a specific conceptual structure. And this creates a situation model, uh, which is then mentally simulated. Uh, if the mental simulation of this problem is, uh, leads to an easy answer that, so here, when we are taking away three to find the answer, uh, it's not difficult to put in place. This is how things will happen. However, uh, this, this way of solving the problem with an informal strategy doesn't always easily lead to a solution. Uh, so for instance, if in the same problem, uh, Luke loses 39 marbles, the same informal strategy uh, based on the initial encoding is not efficient. And in order to solve this problem in a more efficient way, a solver needs to re-represent the initial encoding. So they need to detach from the encoded structure of taking away and re-represent the problem into that of determining the difference based on which they can access a different solving strategy, which is a formal strategy here because they didn't rely on the initial encoding. So an important question that I will address today, today is, is it possible to overcome these informal structural encodings, which are based on the concepts we are familiar with, and by doing so, by overcoming them, access formal arithmetic knowledge? So we will do this by looking at the performance of students who participated in a specific school intervention called Arithmetic Comprehension in Elementary School. And this was a program developed by researchers in mathematics education and cognitive psychology, and it was designed to replace the entire arithmetic curriculum in first grade in France. Uh, the aim of the problem solving domain uh, was uh, in, in this whole program was as it is often the case to relate mathematical knowledge to real world problems. Uh, yet this was done in a per, uh, peculiar way by analyzing word problems through part whole relations and then by searching for the most optimal solving strategy on challenging problems. So we'll first look at how this teaching took place. And uh, students were first tra uh, trained to analyze the underlying structure of the problem. So the structures that actually support their informal solving uh, strategies. So for instance, uh, the problem if we look at a problem, Zoe has a toy train with 16 wagons. Her train has two red wagons and some green ones. How many wagons does Zoe's train have? Well, students were simply asked to find a solution to this problem. Uh, and the informal encoding would lead them to count up from the number of the red wagons to the total number of the wagons. And then they would write down how they found, uh, found this solution with a number sentence. 
Two representational tools were used in order to analyze these part-whole relations. Uh, so a number line on which the different quantities of the problem were proportionally represented. And the second tool was uh, the abstract number box, where the upper part would contain the largest quantity and the two lower boxes would contain the quantities that compose it. Uh, so therefore highlighting these part-whole uh, structural relations. Uh, the second phase was the uh, uh, semantic recoding phase, where students were trained to go beyond their initial encoding. So, of course, none of this terminology was used with the students. Teachers would simply ask them uh, if there is a different way, uh, a more easier way to find the solution to this problem, because a previous strategy would be rather costly. So after, after manipulating with the objects, it would be more easy to see that they can simply switch uh, the train around and uh, that according to this re-representation, they could find the answer by taking away uh, the red wagons in order to find the number of the green wagons. So they would write this down as uh, 16 minus two. And indeed what they did is they changed this initial encoding when they accessed the strategy. And this was also uh, modeled on the number line to, refel, uh, to reflect this new solving strategy on this problem. And the teacher would note that the number box remains the same. So in the current study, uh, we were interested in evaluating the, the efficiency of this program. And we used six different uh, problem categories of word problems since the different semantic structures influence the structural encoding. And for each problem category, we created a, a low-cost mental uh, simulation problem. That is the one uh, where the initial encoding is easy to simulate mentally. And one uh, a high-cost mental simulation version of the problem, that is where the initial encoding would lead to a complicated informal solving strategy. So in total, there was uh, 12 arithmetic word problems that were presented to five classes uh, of students where, that followed a regular arithmetic curricular, so business as usual classes, and five ACE classes. Students were asked to find the solution to each problem and write down the answer. So that was one of the first measures that we took. And uh, they were asked to write down also the solving strategy. So depending on the category of the problem, the strategies that the students noted were classified according to a predetermined coding schema. And we coded as the informal strategy, uh, those that were noted by the students that reflected the initial encoding. And we coded as a formal strategy, those that reflected a recoded representation. Uh, two coders categorized 10% of the strategies randomly sampled in the beginning. And since the integrator rel reliability was 100%, we continue with this coding schema. And additionally, we had uh, control math tasks that were not co uh, co covering domains not covered by the ACE program. And in order to measure students' reasoning about part-whole relations, a transfer task with class inclusion exercises was used. So for example, we presented illustrations with five cats and four dogs and asked students if there are more cats or animals. So we'll first look at the performance rates on these different problems. And uh, we compared students' performance on low-cost mental simulation problems to performance on high-cost mental simulation problems, where the initial encoding should lead to uh, more complicated solving strategies if they stick with it. And uh, firstly, what we see is that we replicated previous findings uh, that, that explain how these processes take place. So indeed, problems that, uh, that what we stipulated would be easy to solve through a mental simulation of the initially encoded representation uh, had higher success rates than high cost mental simulation problems among business as usual classes. This was also the case for ACE students. Uh, and as it was a focus in our study, how we expected, uh, students from the AC uh, classes had higher overall performance than students from the business as usual classes. But even more interestingly, they had uh, better performance on high cost mental simulation problems than students from business as usual class had on low cost mental simulation problems. And now if we look at more closely at the strategies that students use, well, if we look at the formal strategies represented in purple, we see that overall students from the ACE classes, they uh, use more formal strategies uh, overall. And so these formal strategies, they reflected a recoded representation, which allows students to access a different solving strategy than the one they use based on the initial structural encoding. So this is mostly useful when the problem when the initial encoding leads to a costly strategy so on high cost mental simulation problems and indeed students from the ace group used more uh, for uh, formal strategies on high cost mental simulation problems than students from the business as usual classes did 
And additionally, I'll just mention that there were no differences uh, overall on the control tasks. While students from the ACU group had higher performance on the transfer task regard regarding class inclusion. So based on these findings, we provided additional uh, uh, evidence for the influence that structural encodings have on strategies students use and the difficulties that they lead to. And second, students in the AC intervention program were taught to be less dependent on the initial encoding of the situation, which is done through familiar concepts. And this training of semantic recoding that we put in place led them to use more optimal solving strategies more frequently. And just a little teaser, in another study, we looked at how these initial structural encodings based on familiar concepts influence teachers' diagnostics judgments, and we found that it actually leads to certain blind spots. So overall, to conclude, uh, today we, we saw that concepts from daily life are spontaneously used in encodings of both everyday situations, but also in school learning. And these concepts from daily life make structural retrievals possible between superficially dissimilar experiences. Yet switching between various familiar concepts is possible and learning how to do so can favor the uh, conceptual development even in arithmetic and the development of arithmetic competencies. So on behalf of me and Lucas, I would like to thank you all for your attention and we'd be happy